Okay, guys, so this is to help you read along the next section that we're going to focus on, which is um, the encounter with Fezziwig. Now, if you want to listen to this and read along in the hard copy of the book, it's at the bottom of page 26. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words. So as we go through this, I want, to be think I want you to be thinking about what it is that Scrooge learns from Fezziwig in his encounter with him. Because that's what we're going to think about when we come to do a, a small um, writing task about this passage of the text. So we start here. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words, and the room became a little darker and more dirty. The panel shrunk, the windows cracked, fragments of plaster fell out of the ceiling, and the naked lathes were shown instead. Those are the, the kind of wooden beams in the roof of the, of the building. But how all this was brought about, Scrooge knew no more than you. He only knew that it was quite correct, that everything had happened so, that there was, there he was alone again when all the other boys had gone home for the jolly holidays. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge looked at the ghost, and with a mournful shaking of his head, glanced anxiously towards the door. It opened, and a little girl, much younger than the boy, came darting in, and putting her arms about his neck, and often kissing him, addressed him as her dear, dear brother. I have come to bring you home, dear brother, said the child, clapping her tiny hands and bending down to laugh. To bring you home, home, home. Home, little fan, returned the boy. Yes, said the child, brimful of glee. Home for good and all, home for ever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be, that home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, you should. And he sent me in a coach to bring you. And you're to be a man, said the child, opening her eyes. And I'm never to come back here, but first we're to be together all the Christmas long and have the merriest time in all the world. You are quite a woman, little fan, exclaimed the boy. She clapped her hands and laughed and tried to touch his head, but being too little, laughed again and stood on tiptoe to embrace him. Then she began to drag him in her childish eagerness towards the door, and he, nothing loath to go, accompanied her. A terrible voice in the hall cried, Bring down Master Scrooge's box there! And in the hall appeared the schoolmaster himself, who glared on Master Scrooge with a ferocious condescension. Condescension is when you're kind of looking down on someone so he's doing this with real aggression and threw him into a dreadful state of mind by shaking hands with him he then conveyed him and his sister into the veriest old well of a shivering best parlor that ever was seen making it sound like this room a best parlor is like a fancy room is like an old well something you would hold water in in the garden so it's cold where the maps upon the wall and the celestial and terrestrial globes in the windows were waxy with cold. This is of the sky and the earth. Here he produced a decanter of curiously light wine and a block of curiously heavy cake and administered instalments of those dainties to the young people, at the same time sending out a meagre servant to offer a glass of something to the postboy who answered that he thanked the gentleman, but if it was the same tap as he had tasted before, he had rather not. Master Scrooge's trunk, being by this time tied onto the top of the chaise, this is the, the carriage, the children bade the schoolmaster goodbye right willingly, and getting into it, drove gaily down the garden sweep, the quick wheels dashing the hoar-frost and snow from off the dark leaves of the evergreens like spray, to Scrooge's leaving school here, going in a carriage. Always a delicate creature whom a breath might have withered, said the ghost, but she had a large heart. So she had, cried Scrooge. You're right. I will not gainsay it, spirit. God forbid. She died a woman, said the ghost, and had, as I think, children. One child, Scrooge returned. True, said the ghost. Your nephew. Scrooge seemed uneasy in his mind and answered briefly. Yes. Although they had but that moment left the school behind them, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of a city, the pathways of a city, where shadowy passengers passed and repassed, where shadowy carts and coaches battled for the way, and all the strife and tumult, this is like chaos, of a real city were. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops that here too it was Christmas time again, 
but it was evening and the streets were lighted up. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it, said Scrooge. Was I apprenticed here? They went in. At sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind such a high desk, that if he had been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling. Scrooge cried in great excitement. Why, it's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart! It's Fezziwig alive again! Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat. It's big, it's got a lot of capacity. Laughed all over himself, from his shoes to his organ of benevolence. This is his mouth. And called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice. Yo-ho there, Ebenezer, Dick! Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice. Dick Wilkins, to be sure, said Scrooge to the ghost. Bless me, yes, there he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick, dear, dear. Yo-ho, my boy, said Fezziwig. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas, Ebenezer. Let's up the shutters up, cried old Fezziwig, with a sharp clap of his hands, before a man could say Jack Robinson. So I want you to think here. What is different about Fezziwig to Scrooge and his approach to Christmas? You wouldn't believe how those two fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters. One, two, three, had them up in their places. Four, five, six, barred them and pinned them. Seven, eight, nine, and came back before you could have got to twelve, panting like racehorses. They're putting the shutters to the business up really quickly. Hilly ho cried old Fezziwig, skipping down from the high desk with wonderful agility. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Hilly ho Dick, cheer up, Ebenezer. Clear away, there was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off as if it were dismissed from public life forevermore. The floor was swept and watered. The lamps were trimmed. Fuel was heaped upon the fire. And the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright a ballroom as you would desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned like 50 stomach aches. He's tuning his violin and it's sounding awful. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In came the boy from over the way who was suspected of not having bored enough for his master, trying to hide himself behind the girl from next door but one who was proved to have had her ears pulled by her mistress. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling. In they all came, anyhow and everyhow. Away they all went, twenty couple at once, hands half round and back again the other way, down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping. Old top couple always turning up in the wrong place, new top couple starting off again. As soon as they got there, all top couples at last and not a bottom one to help them. When this result was brought about, old Fezziwig, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried out, Well done! Then the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter. Now this is like beer, especially provided for that purpose. But scorning rest upon his reappearance, he instantly began again, though there were no dancers yet, as if the other fiddler had been carried home, exhausted on a shutter, and he were a brand new man resolved to beat him out of sight or perish. This is almost as if... The, the other fiddler is just worn out and gone home and now, but it's actually the same guy, so it's just describing him trying again really hard. There were more dances, and there were more forfeits, and more dances, and there was cake, and there was negus, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and boiled when the fiddler, an artful dog, mind, the sort of man who knew his business better than you or I could have told him, struck up Sir Roger de Coverley. This is a dance. 
Then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig, top couple too, with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them, three or four and twenty pairs of partners, people who are not to be trifled with, people who would dance and had no notion of walking. But if they had been twice as many, ah, four times, old Fezziwig would have been a match for them, and so would Mrs. Fezziwig. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. If that's not high praise, tell me higher and I'll use it. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance like moons. You couldn't have predicted at any given time what would have become of them next. And when old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone all through the dance, advance and retire, both hands to your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle and back again to your place, Fezziwig cut, cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs and came upon his feet again without a stagger. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everybody had retired but the two prentices, they did the same to them, and thus the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds, which were under a counter in the back shop. During the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits. His heart and soul were in the scene and with his former self. He's completely immersed in the past here. He corroborated everything. That means he confirmed it was all true. Remembered everything. Enjoyed everything. And underwent the strangest agitation. It was not until now, when the bright faces of his former self and Dick were turned from them, that he remembered the ghost and became conscious that it was looking full upon him while the light upon its head burnt very clear. A small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Thanks. Small, echoed Scrooge. The spirit signed to him to listen to the two apprentices, who were pouring out their hearts in praise of Fezziwig, when he had done so, said, Why, is it not? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? It isn't that, said Scrooge, heated by the remark, and speaking unconsciously like his former, not his latter self. It isn't that spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them up. What then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. He felt the spirit's glance and stopped. What is the matter? asked the ghost. Nothing particular, said Scrooge. Something, I think, the ghost insisted. No, said Scrooge. No, I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. His former self turned down the lamps as he gave utterance to the wish, and Scrooge and the ghost again stood side by side in the open air.